Hello, everybody, and welcome to the TF1 show. I'm your host, Tinas Ferreira, and this is the Belgian Grand Prix recap episode. Now, I'm very excited to be joined today by my guest, Fergus, who is from the Understeer podcast. So, Fergus, can you please just tell the ladies and gentlemen a bit about what you do and where your show is and where we can go find and listen to you? Awesome. So, hello, everyone. It's an absolute pleasure to be on the TF1 show. Um, my name is Fergus, as uh, Tinas mentioned, and I run a podcast slash channel uh, called The Undersea Podcast, and you can you can find all the podcast episodes on pretty much every platform. I don't know what half of them are, but just usual Spotify, Apple, YouTube, and then you can find sort of little extra bits and bobs on my YouTube channel as well, like my Who the Hell Is series and that kind of thing. So, um. If you like the sound of that, I would be, I would appreciate it a lot if you could uh, check it out. Brilliant. So, and I'll also definitely link all of Fergus's, you know, channel links and his social media links and things like that in the description of this episode. So please go and check Fergus out. I think I've also been on there on one of his episodes and it's, it's always great fun. <laughs> so let's jump straight into our race review given that you know the uh, these ones they always run quite quite long so let's 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 cut into the meat of what you know why we're here tonight and maybe before before we start talking about each of the teams i want to know fergus what did you think about the race in general um i thought it was like a bit of what we've seen quite a lot this year that we're like oh on monday we hear, I'm not sure if you listen to the WTF1 podcast, but I was listening to that and there were like 100% chance of raining, you know, or us F1 Just... fans rub, <laughs> rubbing our hands together. We get to Spa, where are the clouds? It's literally blue sky. Um, obviously, it's nice to watch Spa, uh, sort of the cars around there. I thought there was a good little midfield battle. I think there was a, some people are touting it as boring. Yes, it wasn't the most exciting race, but I wouldn't say it's the most boring race I've ever seen. But I'm sure we'll talk more about it later. Yeah, I was just cross. Like, I agree with you, actually. I had big hopes. I'd like, a, for some reason, I always have big expectations of Belgium because I love the track. I think it's just a really, really fun track to watch. And obviously, with you know the weather forecast, I was thinking like, oh, this is going to be amazing. I mean, the spa and the wet, it's just going to be such a nice race weekend. And then literally, they predicted rain. I think for Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and it didn't rain mm -hmm. for any like for any session. And I did. That's just that's just annoying. And you know, I mean, ironically, I just yes. sorry, ironically uh, this happened after Spain as well. Yes. Uh, that started raining afterwards uh after the grand prix had finished it's like they're mocking us fergus <laughs> it's like they're mocking us literally apparently lit an hour after the race ended on sunday it hasn't stopped raining since it's just been raining <laughs> the whole of yesterday and the whole of today in belgium like like the clouds was <laughs> was deliberately holding back it's downpour until the Grand Prix finished. And mm. well, that's that's my first sort of issue with the race weekend, but I guess a bit out of everyone's control. But the second one, like, <laughs> yes, I, I hear what you're saying. It was wasn't as bad maybe as Spain. And and we've I've discussed this with a couple of people already, where like immediately after the race finished, I was fuming. Like I was so angry at what happened during the race i was thinking like how is this worse than spain this is supposed to be belgium and it's worse than spain and i was just very cross and then mm. you know i took a step back i self-reflected and i realized that maybe it wasn't worse than spain but i think i just had much higher expectations um you know compared you know because we when we go to spain we know it's going to be a bit of a dreary one right mm. like I don't know, you have to, you need to, you probably, a volcano needs to erupt next to the track for something exciting <laughs> to happen in Spain. But with Spa, like, I, I just really hoped it would be a bit of a cracker. And I think it almost was. But then what we got instead for the last 20 laps was the front three drivers just tiptoeing around the circuit, <laughs> managing tires. And Fergus, I was so angry watching. Hamilton and Bottas and Verstappen going around four or five seconds slower than what they can 
just like because the, they were so hell bent on making that one stop strategy work because the teams were like, no, we're going to be three or four seconds slower if we spit now and, and <laughs> you know, and try and push to the end. It's better. It's the optimum strategy that. is to do a one stop. Mm. And that just frustrates me so much because yeah. like I can taste I can taste this race being <laughs> interesting and exciting. And then we get. The only one that did it properly, or the only two people that did it properly was, was Gasly and Ricardo. Everybody else was literally going like, oh, no, my tires. Oh, I, I'm feeling vibrations. Oh, like, it's, I, yeah, it just made me very cross. And I want to get your thoughts on this, actually, because I think this is, like, such a, an easy fix. Why don't the FIA just make it compulsory for teams to run all three tyre compounds during the race. Yeah, it's what Corinne Chandock's been saying for quite yes. a while. I think it's gathering more momentum, but it's like the reverse grid proposition. It's a good but idea. But do you think but... so? Like, I don't think, I don't think it takes away, like, the meritocracy of it, if you get what I'm saying. Like, I feel the reverse grid, the argument against the reverse grid is like, well, then you don't really celebrate... You know, it's not in the competitive spirit of Formula One. You're essentially punishing people for doing well. Where, yeah, but like, here, yeah, you, if all you... that. Yeah, sorry, continue. Sorry, okay, but if you say you have a wet race at the start and you're in the inters and you put them to the slicks, do you then have to go to a four or four stop, a three stop race even? No, but I think like during wet races, it was always the case that if it's wet at any point, it's sort of free for all when it comes to dry tires, then you can use whatever. Then you don't have any um, sort of requirements, which I think is fine. They can keep it like that. But I'm just saying like if you essentially force people to make at least two pit stops, you increase jeopardy, right? You essentially mm. like think about safety cars, like safety cars are going to screw up so many people's strategies when they have to do a two stop compared to a one stop. Because yeah, what teams true. are doing now is they're going onto the medium if they can and then running as long as possible to minimize the probability of some safety car screwing up their race strategy. Yeah. So it's I like just a, they can give it a try. Yeah, I, th- I, I agree. I agree. But uh, as I was saying, that it's a reverse grid thing. It looks good, but then you have, they say that the yeah. Concord agreement is you can't, the unbalanced thing doesn't work. But I think that the unbalancing that Mercedes, Ferrari, all these, uh, what teams actually will, like, apart from, like, Haas, will want to do the three compounds when they vote it. Yeah, agreed. Like, that's that's the thing. Is the teams are going to not want it because it, it adds more variability. And any, like, any strategists are going to tell you the more variables there are, the more of a mess it becomes. So teams want yeah. things to be as predictable as possible. But I think, like, that's a good thing to try out, especially in a season like this season, without taking away, like, with, because I think the reverse grid proposition is much more, how can I say, much more controversial, I feel, than what something like this would be. All I think is teams are going to have, they, they would have the possibility of pushing the tires harder for longer, because the thing is, the only, like, if you think about a hard tire or a medium tire, they're going to have to put on the other ones anyway. So the probable the probable fastest strategy is to use each of the three tires equally. I don't know. This is just me thinking out loud, though. So, I mean, Formula <laughs> 1, if you're listening, just listen to me. People have been telling me I have really good ideas, and it's not just my mom. So just listen to me and <laughs> try it. Like, I feel if we can try the Bahrain whatever you call it, like oval, triangle, that, if you can try that track, we can try a race with all three tire compounds. And and I think on that on that note, Fergus, let's maybe move into our proper uh, like recap and review of of the Belgian Grand Prix. And let's start with Mercedes. Now, Mercedes, there's not actually that much we can say about the team, right? We know the team is going to be really fast. I think they're still going to be fast next week, despite the whole engine mode shenanigans. I think that's a whole debate for another day around what we think is going to happen there. But Fergus, what we can say is I think Hamilton has now, I think, has reinforced his grip on the championship. I think the Belgian Grand Prix was maybe the straw that broke the camel's back of Bartes' championship campaign. Mm. The 
I think the Bottas, he obviously he got the he got the the obviously won the first race. We all know that that crazy race in Austria, and he came second. And and I think it always looked from the start today that every time, like obviously we saw. I think did you tweet about? I saw someone tweeting about it that he was coming up to through a uh, Rouge and Radion. Uh, yeah, comments. yeah, I tweeted about it, and then Hamilton went off the throttle. And he blocked off Bottas, and that was pretty much a race. And then the safety car, Hamilton got away, and Bottas was behind. Like, I think obviously it's easy to say that Valtteri is not a good driver or whatever, but I think that Valtteri is a good driver. But I think that Lewis is a great driver. Uh, he's clearly just, I mean, ever since he lost to Rosberg in 2016, he's pretty much unbeatable at the moment. And take a brilliant driver like Lewis. And then put him in a brilliant car. It's a championship, really. It's his yeah. team. So it's what I tweeted, I think, last week that um, that Max would actually never win a championship if he went to Mercedes because Mercedes is Lewis's team. So uh, I just don't see it happening. I always think. I also think it's going to be really difficult for anyone else to to beat him, especially in that team. And I think Hamilton has so many tricks in his book. And I think this. Grand Prix just you know showcased it um you like and he does and what Hamilton is very good with I think is he done he does a lot of like subtle things that is not immediately apparent to the viewer you won't like it won't jump out at you in watching like little things that he does so well that makes it very difficult for his you know for his opponents like what he did you know to Bartas just before Eau Rouge lifting off and essentially avoiding he, avoiding the fact that he can get a, a good slipstream you know up up the Kimmel mm. straight and I think that just and, and I mean qualifying as well you know Bottas is in trouble and this is now I think the second time where he said I think Silverson was the first one where he basically admitted after the race that actually he doesn't know how or why Hamilton is so much quicker Mm-hmm. Like, you know, he, he always usually had some sort of reason for why it didn't work. Like he had a he had a moment here or something happened here and that's why he lost a tenth or two. But like literally he couldn't explain why he was half a second down. Like he thought his lap was good, which to me is worrying, which means I think Hamilton is now in that, he's now operating in that, that plane where Bartes can't access. I don't think Bartes can access that sort of level of performance. And that's a problem for Valtteri because if if Hamilton is beating him in what is supposed to be Bottas's good areas of his you know driver toolbox, if you can call it that, so qualifying. Bottas's strength is how good he is in qualifying, and Hamilton yep. is like he's properly beating him at the moment. And then I mean we know how much better Hamilton is in the race, and that just makes for a bit of a a bit of a tough one, I think. Yeah, I mean, just Hamilton, he's obviously, he's, he's, you would say his strength is in the race, obviously, but I think pretty much what you've mentioned, there's not really much I can say that he's just got everything on Bottas. He's underneath Bottas's skin. I've noticed recently, I'm not sure if you noticed that, he doesn't refer to Bottas as Valtteri or Bottas, he refers to him as he always. Yes. Like, he's like, he, is there something going on between them or is that just mind games from uh, him? I think it's just Hamilton like being super focused. I think I think Hamilton literally wants to crush him this year. Like remove any doubt as to who who the better driver is because every year and I also find this annoying about people because it's like a, you know that saying like only a donkey will just will you know ram his head against the same rock twice type thing i don't know if if that if that saying exists like it's a it's a it's an africa it's a it's a saying in my home language let's just let's just say that but like we're all donkeys every year we say oh well, this is the year bottas is ready he's you know <laughs> eaten porridge he's, i mean we need bottas 7.0 at this stage because <laughs> it's it's not working is it no, so i guess I guess to wrap up on Mercedes, don't want to stick with them too long. I mean, the car is incredible. Watching that lap around, Hamilton's qualifying lap around Spa was just so, so amazing to watch. Um, Hamilton is incredible. Hamilton and the car together is incredible. Hamilton is 50 points ahead of Bottas in the championship, 47 ahead of Verstappen. 
So, I mean, bar complete he, he doesn't even know. He doesn't even know that he's uh, outside the, you know, that far ahead of Bottas, which I found quite amusing. Yeah, like, he doesn't care. He just knows he's beating him. <laughs> the thing is, like, bar absolute disaster for Hamilton. I think he's going to win the championship at this point because he is mm. now two race retirements ahead. So he can literally not score twice. And Bottas wins both of those races and he's still, you know, in yeah. the championship. But anyways, let's maybe talk about Max Verstappen and his lovely little Red Bull team. Mm. Now, this was an interesting one for me for Red Bull. I think they could have done better, I feel. Like, I don't know. That was sort of just sort of my impression of them after the race. Don't know if you agree or not. Um. To be honest, I they I think that Verstappen could have potentially got past uh, Bottas if they'd have gone for the undercut strategy about 12 laps before the end mm-hmm. because they were all thinking about it and then uh, no one actually did it. But I think the way that with the one stop, once I think I heard someone saying that the move had to be made by turn nine if Ricardo wanted any chance of going past. And the same with Verstappen, he's got to make his move early. Didn't make mm. the move, and he he always says after the race that it's just boring for him. Like just, uh, it's just you know, it's just all you can always predict who the top three are going to be. Albon, on the other hand, he was kind of I know what you you can talk more about Albon because I know what you're like, but uh, from what <laughs> I saw, from what I saw, he was kind of as per usual the way that they built the car around Max. They also uh, giving him the strategy, like saying qualifying. Everyone was like, oh, that's very nice of Red Bull letting Albon have the slipstream of Max in Q2 after they're both safely through Q3. Alex, off you go ahead. You know, that sort of thing, Mm. putting him on the mediums as well. Just the lamb to the slaughter, you know. Yeah, I look and you, you, you said how I, you know, my typical feelings about Alex Albon. Look, I was slightly put out after the race. I sort of hoped for better from Alex. Um, but again, thinking about it, I realized that actually red, it was, it was again, and I can have so many people say no, but the, every race, there's some sort of excuse for Alex. But the fact of the matter is if you want Alex to sort of get to the point where he's sort of in the running for a podium, you need to support him adequately. And I really don't think Red Bull is doing that or, and they're trying to, but when it comes to deciding between Alex and Max who to prioritize, they are prioritizing Max, which is fine in itself. But then you're going to get things that happen to Alex, like what happened in Spa, which was firstly, I think he actually qualified. His qualifying was pretty encouraging, I would say. I think, he, you know, even his Q3 lap where he was giving the slipstream to Max, he made a mistake in turn one, which cost him like apparently two to two and a half tenths. And look, yes, he made a mistake, but the thing is, I'd much rather him make a blatant error that costs him X amount of time, and then he knows, okay, that's where I lost the time, and without that time, he would have actually been pretty close to max. Like, that, to me, is a positive outcome, compared Mm. to, you know, a couple of races back where Alex just didn't sort of know where he was and why he was slower than max. It was just sort of slow. He was basically slower throughout the circuit. Like, that, to me, is more concerning than... Mm what this weekend was at Spa, where, yes, he made a mistake, but without that mistake, he would have, you know, it would have, he would have been pretty much in the running. So that, to me, was the first positive. The second positive was, well, not really a positive, but I, I guess a bit of a mitigating factor in the race was I think Red Bull wanted to do two stop with Alex. That's why they put him on the mediums. They thought, they thought okay, well, we could we can be a bit creative here. Let's put Max on the hard to match the Mercedes strategy. And let's put Alex on the medium. You know, firstly, different tire. Let's see how that goes. And then secondly, then we can two-stop him and see what happens. And then it became (laughs) apparent that the Red Bull car and the similar problem, actually, that the Mercedes had, obviously, but, you know, not, not not an issue for them. But the Renaults and the Alpha Tauris were too fast on the straights. And I think Reno, I think Red Bull realized that, you know, with Alex, that Alex was like way faster than them in sector two, but 
couldn't even with DRS get proper close to them in sector one where he had to make the overtake. Like it took him a couple of laps to really like get as close as he can and then, you know, hope, you know, the, the guy in front loses a bit of traction down a rouge or whatever and then he can make the pass stick. But I think yeah. that's sort of what ruined Red Bull's plans because they realized actually putting that car behind the Renaults is not going to work. And and Max actually came out and said after the race that, you know, Red Bull were thinking about doing the two stop, but literally decided against it because even Max thought he he didn't think he was going to be able to get past Daniel. Yeah. Which should tell you that, you know, I know people are cross with Alex for taking long to get past Gasly and to get past Ocon or whatever, but legitimately i don't think that red bull was an easy car to make overtakes with with with, yep. with the renos being 20 kph faster on the straights mm -hmm. so i mean that's why in typical me fashion i will reserve my judgment on alex albon i would say he's improving i really really do think it, it's getting better it's slowly getting better but it's getting better and i will emphasize again it's not going to be like one miraculous weekend where all of a sudden Alex is like on Max's pace immediately. This yeah. is going to be a slow and steady process where hopefully by the end of the year, they've figured out what goes for what and sort of where Alex needs the car to be, because that it sounds like that's still a bit of an ongoing process. I don't know. I don't know what you think. Yeah, I think um, Alex getting used to that car. I think I heard them saying on Sky that, uh, when they switched to last year, Gasly got back into the Toro Ross and he thought, oh, but I mean, this is, you know, a lot easier to drive. So if that album was still in that Toro, well, Alfa Tauri now, I think he would be doing what Pierre is doing at the moment. So I think Red Bull, I, act, I genuinely think they will this time. Give them a bit of patience. Like I've heard someone inside knowledge from Red Bull saying that, uh, that, that if Albon does do pretty badly then they're going to look outside the market for drivers like Perez and Hulkenberg so mm. yeah and it makes sense I think I think also and and people keep coming out and saying like yeah but Red Bull they're so much nicer to Albon than what they were to Pierre I think literally Red Bull realized when Alex also started struggling that it's maybe not the driver yeah. The car, there's some fundamental issues with the car, or at least sort of the drivability of the car, that Max has found a way to drive around mm. that the other drivers hasn't figured out yet. And I think that's why they realized that, oh, actually, there's no point in booting Alex at the first opportunity because, firstly, nobody wins in that situation. And secondly, they might actually have to figure out a bit more with their car specifically to make it you know, more accessible to somebody that isn't called Max Verstappen, because at the end of the day, you need two solid drivers in that car. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I think that's kind of all I could say about Red Bull. I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, yeah, happy else. with that. Maybe before we move to our favorite, our favorite little red, red team. Um, let's. Do you Traction. think maybe Fergus? Do you think the the engine mode? Um, you know, the, 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 the wind down of the engine modes in quali. Do you think that's going to bring Red Bull into play? In um, to be perfectly honest, no. I think it could bring maybe teams, not Red Bull. I think maybe we could see Renault sniffing for a top three, like possibly. Um, mm. the, the thing is with this quali mode, right? I'm not sure if you remember in Spain, right? Every team was running the quali mode except Mercedes. And there was still... Yeah, Mercedes countries. was just like... <laughs> Mercedes was just, you know, um, joking around a bit. I think that, that was literally just them being petty. I love that actually about them. They were like, okay, well, you wanna you wanna take about engine modes? We won't even run our quali mode, and I've qualified <laughs> yes. them at, at seven tenth. Exactly. Like, that's a power play if you've ever, if you've if you've ever seen if you've ever seen it. Um, I guess maybe last thought on that. Um, I think who it's going to disadvantage more is um, Racing Point and Williams. Yep. I think they're going to be the big losers in this situation. I think yep. Mercedes's car is good enough for it to not be a problem, but I think Racing Point and Williams are going to be pretty upset. I think they're mm. going to lose out. Yeah. But anywho, let's speaking about losing out. Let's talk about um, our favorite little red team, Ferrari. The red tractor. Now, Fergus. 
Yes, the red tractor, the red combine harvester, I've also heard. <laughs> now, Fergus, when last did you see a disaster as big as Ferrari's attempt in Belgium? Yeah, I think uh, obviously we saw, was it 2014 was probably the last time that they had a horrific car. Um, and this isn't even a regulation change, which Ferrari are quite notorious for uh, stuffing up. And it was kind of, I mean... I, I don't want to get a ton of Tifosi haters in your comments by saying this. It's fine, but they can I, come. I, <laughs> I'm i not going to lie, I quite enjoyed seeing uh, Kimi Raikkonen and, and, and Charles Leclerc battling with Roman Grosjean in the house. <laughs> Imagine. But, uh, I did kind of want them to be slow, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> no, but you, you know what? I agree. Like I was also sort of, sort of sitting there feeling vindicated. Because they have just been messing around for how was, many years now? I was quite they've disappointed. They've been wasting our time. That's what they've been doing. Exactly. All of this big talk, I mean, and what do we have? We have 13th and 14th after the race. Like, and it, you know what? Look, and I feel bad for, for Vettel, and I feel bad for Leclerc, and I feel mm. bad for the team. I feel bad for like, the mechanics and the engineers and the designers. And I cannot really the strategists because, I mean, they're, they're, they're a different breed as well. But, like, Mattia Bonotto, does he think we're idiots? Like, I need to ask you this, Fergus. Because you know, like, every time they ask him, and, and, he do, and he, it's like the whole year, when they ask him a question, he's like, no. Like, especially, especially this weekend. He was like, no. He thinks it's a once-off thing. <laughs> he thinks it was, like, a very track-specific problem. And I was like, Mattia... You're not <laughs> literally you're not fooling anyone. Nobody is listening to you going like, mm, yes, yes, that is the truth. It's not. We all know why they were slow. <laughs> like even the drivers, you could see Sebastian when they told Vettel, you know, that's what Matthias said. Vettel was literally laughing behind his mask because mm -hmm. he knows what's how ridiculous it is. And that's why, like, as you said, Fergus. I was sort of slightly, I was sort of smug, and it's horrible to say, but I was sitting there being smug about them suffering like this because Binotto is taking all of us, he, th he thinks he's taking all of us for the fool, but he isn't. And yeah, it just makes me cross. Yeah, if I hear the word transparency come out of... Uh, yes, clarity and transparency in that Sky Sports, <laughs> your, in that Sky Sports feature that they did, he was like, yes. All that Ferrari wants from this racing point break duct um, investigation is clarity and transparency. And I spit out my drink. I was drinking water at that point. And I was just thinking, like, what a clown. Mm, I know. I think with Ferrari, obviously, you you got to be thinking, if Vettel, he's lucked out big time if he's off now. If he, you know, because he wanted to stay on. And I don't think, I think he would have been regretting that, um, that, uh, signing on if he'd you know been offered that to go down the budget cut and also I think one of the few things that I'm not sure if you're on the same feed as us but in Sky Sports are you on uh, Euro uh, what's the thing called they have in America Eurosport no no so we have our own little special channel called Super Sport oh. but we get the same Sky Sports feed yeah so. that's the one Super Sport I remember I was in uh, Namibia and they had Super Sport um, but yeah. The one thing that the cameraman actually did right, because they're usually a bit incompetent, let's be truthful, mm -hmm. um, was the cut to signs shaking his head. Now, I yes. think they've thrown signs under the bus there. Oh, and I reckon my word. that was probably taken out of context and was probably recorded, like, I know, after he messed up qualifying or he just got back from his race because... Surely Carlos Sainz is that stupid to shake his head uh, in for the Ferrari, but uh, you know, no. it's like it's like the damn tick to radio message. You're not going to convince anyone otherwise now. They've thrown him under the bus and bye bye Carlos. Yeah, uh, it's so funny. Like I thought, I thought that was very funny when they showed Carlos shaking his head. But also, how cruel for Carlos! First, to not not you know starting the race, and then secondly, just having to watch his team next year being overtaken mm. by the McLaren and then the Alfatari and then the Haas 
and then <laughs> Alfa Romeo. Like he's just watching the team go backwards in real time. I mean, that would have been <laughs> that would have been quite oppressing. Um, but I don't know. Let's let's maybe move on to our our little group or gaggle of midfield teams. So McLaren, Renault, um, Alfa Tauri, Racing Point. Let's maybe touch on each of them briefly. I maybe want to start and just give props to uh, Daniel Ricciardo and also to Renault. Yes, Alfa because Alfa. I think okay. Renault. <laughs> Renault has built a very, very good engine, and it's just been overshadowed by the big gains Mercedes has made with theirs. But that Renault engine, I think, is a pretty powerful one. I mean, even you know Norris and Sainz and at McLaren have been giving lots of compliments for how good the engine is this year. Yeah, I mean, you got to feel for. Obviously, we all know that Honda is the better project than Renault, but you got to feel for Christian Horner uh, when you got Ricardo battling the people. Bear in mind, Red Bull have a much better aero package. And then you've got the the engine that you've just binned off last year is significantly quicker than the one you've signed on for. Um, but, you know, in 2022, we might think that this was a master plan by, um, what's his face, Christian Horner. So, um, yeah, who knows? But uh, I, I agree, Renault were obviously very quick. Before qualifying, Esteban Ocon was pretty much in all three practice sessions, was king of sector one. Uh, they yeah. were flying up. He was sending lots of purple there. Um, to be fair, um, uh, credit where credit's due, Esteban Ocon had probably his best race of the season and, you yeah. know, maybe start to prove the doubters wrong. Yes, Beth, I'm looking at you if you're listening. Uh, <laughs> For those of you who don't know, Beth uh, is, an, is a fellow content creator and she isn't a fan of Ocon and I'm very much a supporter of him. And I agree with you, Fergus. I think he did a, a really good job. Um, he's not on Daniel's pace yet, so, you know, still room for improvement. But, you know, was good throughout, decent pace. Um, I mean, Daniel was really, really strong this weekend. This is probably his strongest race weekend that I've seen from him at Reno. Um, probably one of his strongest ones since, you know, when he and was Monza. at Monza. You know, yeah, I had Monza, but last, last year Monza wasn't as spectacular <laughs> just because Puff for the q3 yeah yeah and, and also like if you remember um a max started from the back he had an engine penalty yeah. so like red there was a bit of fortune there for Renault. i felt with monza where mm. um with with this this was like a proper like reno one on merit or came fourth on merit here which which i think yeah. is very encouraging for them now, McLaren, uh, a, a, a decent, another decent showing for McLaren. I think I listened to another podcast, can't remember which one, and they actually made a good point where McLaren, you know, they are there every single race. For, doesn't matter what type of track, what type of condition, McLaren is showing up, which I think for them is very encouraging. Like, yes, Renault, yeah. they were faster this weekend, but McLaren was after Renault probably the fastest team. I mean, racing point, yes. It was sort of there or thereabouts, but I mean, Carlos was great in qualifying, Lando good in qualifying as well, and obviously good in the race. So if I was McLaren, I'd be pretty pleased. Yeah, I think with uh, McLaren, obviously for Carlos Sainz, uh, when it rains, it pours for him. Probably the less said, the better for uh, poor Carlos. He's probably having nightmares every night. He's got insomnia. Um, <laughs> I saw, I saw. Um, I'm not sure if you ever watched the meme reviews of the race, and it was Carlos Sainz and and Mattia Binotto. They were speaking to me. And he was like, "It says in the contract that we have put our engine in for this race," and then he's like, "What?" And then it's like not working because of the thing which I, <laughs> I found no quite shame. amusing. I I feel I feel bad for Carlos because I mean the the, the score sheet is showing that he's that Lando Norris is beating him comprehensively. But I would argue ever since Silverstone, Carlos has been the better driver. Mm. I think probably ever since that, well, the chassis changes obviously helped him. But I think, obviously, uh, Lando had, you know, just Lando was there. Like, typical Sky, we didn't see him until the end when we saw him behind uh, the Ocon being overtaken yeah. uh, thing. But, you know, he was just doing the Carlos Sainz 2019 job, just, you know. Yeah. Chilling there, uh, Gasly had a bit of a shower at him in, was it FP1? Yeah. Uh, when he wasn't very happy when uh, Norris was in his way. But otherwise, 
you know, a pretty uneventful weekend for McLaren yeah. apart from which is the, which uh, is I think a good thing, in a way, like just going, you know, plugging away, doing their thing, making sure they maximize. Now, obviously, Carlos had a bit of a a bit of a problem, but I think they would still. I think if if they had to take stock of you know where their car is relative to everybody else's, how their drivers are performing, McLaren would be pretty happy. Yeah, and I think uh, should we move on to racing points? Let's do it. Let's talk about racing points. Um, I have not much to point. say. Ooh, you I have a have point. About racing point. A bit of a Hit worry me. for racing point. Right, so a couple of things to consider. Right, racing point. Did they just come... Because obviously this package is going to be for Monza as well, which I mm-hmm. suppose is not such an issue for Monza. But did they come to Spa with about 1% downforce? Because they're about three temps up in the first sector. And they lost about seven temps in the second with all the, the twisty turny, I think. I think it's quite worrying for them that they're sitting in ninth and tenth. And bear in mind, this is the 2019 Mercedes car. The Mercedes have got the most out of it. It pretty much is a Mercedes car. How much can Racing Point develop a car that was pretty much maxed out by Mercedes trying to catch Ferrari in straight line speed last year? I mean, I don't know what you think. No, I think that's a very good point. I think the issue is... And that's, I guess, one of the pitfalls of taking the approach that they've taken to sort of, you know, leverage off another team's philosophy and sort of trying to reverse engineer, you know, in a way, you know, what they did. Where I don't think they understand that car in all conditions yet. So it's evident what they tried to do was the thing that they always used to do back in the day at Spa is basically trim off all downforce (laughs) and just be super fast in sector one and sector three. And then, lim- you know, do damage limitation in sector two. But mm. as we saw with Mercedes this year and last year, where Mercedes did not take that approach. If you remember, Mercedes, again, had, you know, put on a bit more wing for the first the, the first and the last sector. And, um, you know, made up, like, at one point it was like almost a second on Ferrari. And this was last year now, um, you know, in, in sector two, where I think that design it seems like the more optimum direction for this version or variety of car is at spa at least to rather you know sort of limit your losses in this in the straight sections and then make up big gains through through, mm. through the twisty bits and i think racing point missed that memo i think they were mm. like okay let's just do what we've always done it's been successful in the past and actually, it turns out didn't work that well for them. And I agree, it's a bit of a worry for Monza because, again, this concept isn't really their own. So I think when they go about developing this car, I think it's not as easy as you would imagine. I think they're going to yeah. have to really, I think, you know, yeah, it's, it's a bit of an interesting one, actually, um, racing point, I have to say. Yeah, I think... Uh, racing point, yeah, obviously, as you said, there's not really much to say about it. The one thing that maybe is to consider, um, just very briefly, uh, that Mercedes were still running their full downforce package from Spain. They haven't put their Monza one on yet. So maybe that was the way for uh, Racing Point to go to, maybe because it's different philosophy. It's not the Red Bull sort of car anymore. It's a Mercedes car. Yeah. Maybe that it would be more wise to, obviously, it would, in hindsight, it's a great thing. That's why these double headers are great. But I think maybe it could have been more wise for them to, you know, just think, we'll just, you know, lower that front ring or whatever, or raise it, whatever they do to add the downforce. Yeah, I think. But then the question is, I, I don't think they had the know-how to bring like two completes Sort of because Mercedes pitched up with a low downforce and a high downforce approach. They were like, okay, we have two potential options. We'll try out both and then make a decision. Where well, I don't mm. think Racing Point did that. I think they pitched up with one and maybe like <laughs> and sort of tried, but then they could try and add more downforce to that one approach. But I don't think that worked for them. So mm. yeah, interesting for Monza to see what approach they take. I agree. Let's quickly move on to um, AlphaTauri. I just want to touch on them quick. There's not, again, much to say except good job, Pierre Gasly. I think he's driving yeah. very, very well. Uh, although, he seems much more at home in, in, in that car compared to, obviously, yeah. the Red Bull. Although if I see another onboard of Gasly going down Eau Rouge, 
with Perez, I will just feel like, yes, it's a great move, but I don't need my whole Twitter feed to be reposting at the same time. Like, I mean, come on, guys. <laughs> no, I F1 agree. F1 struggle. Yeah, <laughs> F1 struggle, 100%. Cool, but I think conclusion we can draw there is good job, Pierre Gasly. Um, yeah, you're doing a good job. Let's quickly talk about our three other sort of teams bringing up the rear. Um, the one thing I would like to highlight is, and I'm, I'll, I'll speak sort of in broad terms, and then Fergus, you can chip in with your thoughts if you want. Yep. Kimi Raikkonen, strongest race from him in a long time, I think. Yeah, he was King of Spa. really, really solid. King of Spa, as you, that's a good point actually. I forgot about that. You know, he just showed it again that he knows he knows that track and know, he knows how to drive that track. Beat both Ferraris, fastest Ferrari engine car out of everybody. Great, great stuff. Antonio Giovinazzi, um, not a great, not a great performance. I have to say, with all of the Ferrari juniors showing up so well in in F2, I, I'm worried for him. I think mm. he had to make a bit of a step up this season, and he. Every time where I feel it's sort of going in a positive direction for him, he has a weekend like this, where yep. qualifying is sort of an opportunity lost. He crashes out in the race, makes a mess, and no, it's just getting tough for me, I think, to justify another seat for him next year at this point. Yeah. Um, not really. Yeah, to be honest, Giovinazzi, he span. Kind of every time he spins, I always put in the the sacred chat um, about his Tillis's theory uh, being correct. And, you know, he's obviously, <laughs> if you haven't heard the theory, is that Gio Vicrashi, as I, I will nickname him for now, um, <laughs> or how it's actually meant to be Joe Vicrashi, isn't it? But anyway, um, he, he span, his wheel went flying off. Russell was lucky that he didn't hit him in the halo. That's pretty much all to say about Alpha. All right, let's talk about... Let's talk about Haas quickly. Um, again, really not that much. I want to say they are similar. <laughs> like the thing is, Haas has just been so anonymous. I guess maybe it's a good thing compared to last year, where we had so much to say about them every weekend because they were just doing the most ridiculous things. Where this year, at least, it's a bit calmer. Where they, at least, you know, finishing the races more often than not. Um, yeah, Grosjean did well. Magnussen did okay. I don't know if you have anything to add. Uh, not really. Just I was a bit disappointed that Haas didn't put on the wets or something for the beginning, you know, just <laughs> to be a Haas. Yeah, to, you know, to, <laughs> to, to try something different. <laughs> Agreed. Of, of course. Uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. <laughs> cool. Okay, let's, let's chat about Williams quick. Now, George Russell, again, great in qualifying. I mean, he's turning into a bit of a qualifying specialist, interestingly. I think the car still seems like a bit of a handful in races. Sounds like, especially on high fuel, like at the start of the race, the the Williams is like, it's like trying to navigate, you know, a World War II oil tanker or World War II battleship around the corners. Like it's, it's it's quite unstable and and doesn't really want to change direction. So um, I, I I'm I'm gonna give you know Russell a pass for you know, his, his race performances compared to his qualifying performances because I think the car seems to be a bit better in quality trim compared to race trim. Latifi, yeah. I mean, still a way off Russell, you know, over one lap. I think his race craft is getting better. I think he's doing solid, solidly well, sort of in the same category as Grosjean and Magnussen and, and Giovinazzi. Um, don't know if that's a compliment, but that's sort of where I feel the level that he's operating at. Maybe he's a bit more consistent than than the others, but that's that's basically sort of my feeling about about Latifi at the moment. Yeah, pretty. I think Latifi. Every week I'll still predict him a pole, whatever happens. Um, I mean, no, shit there. He's actually not. Like, he's doing better than I thought he would. So, uh, you know, we can give him a, whoever keeps giving him one out of ten in the in the ratings. Please stop. But uh, I th they've stopped now this week. I had a talk. I gave everybody a talking to because yeah, <laughs> literally for every for every race, somebody gives Latifi a one out of ten. I'm like, what must the man do? Someone to gave him a two you? though. Someone gave him a two, and someone gave him an eight. Someone gave Vettel and Leclerc a nine. Uh, yeah. yeah, that's Matteo Bonotto. I don't know if you know, but he votes on <laughs> on the F1 content community rankings. I'm assuming like you he, gave Ocon a he, ten. 
he mails in his votes, Matia, because he still <laughs> thinks he's fooling us. So, I mean, you heard it here first, ladies and gentlemen. But I guess, Fergus, let's let's maybe move on to our um, our final little segment on on the review. We've now covered all of the teams, and that is the TF1 Awards. Now, Fergus, I say this um, during every race review that we do on this podcast, but I don't know if you know, but I've heard many people say, and and people you know people like include including this is you know Ted Kravitz, um, mm. Will Buxton. Um, you know, Matthew Gallagher yeah. from WTF1, all of them have noted that, you know, on balance, and if you sort of take a very much an objective view, like I tend to do on, on this podcast, the TF1 awards, that's probably the most illustrious award that you can award somebody in the world of Formula One. That's the only reason they go racing. Forget the money. It's a TF1 chair award. Exactly. Exactly. I'm glad you understand so then let's move on to our first award of the, the, the Belgian Grand Prix. And that is, of course, the Pastor Maldonado Award for Most Dunderheaded Deed. Now, Fergus, I don't know if you have any nominees. Ah, oh, so I have two nominees and they both come from the pit wall, right? Am I allowed uh, to put two in? Please, please right. put in two. So, so my first one, they're both quite brief ones, is um, Peter Bonington, or Bono as you might know him. Mm -hmm. It's for, t for turning Lewis's car down up the hill, just to tease us even more with Lewis losing I power. I see. It was clever. And the second one um, is Kimi, um, Kimi Raikkonen's strategist in Alpha. You could probably say the Ferrari as well. But when Kimi wanted to go on the mediums, yeah, and then he said, let's go on the mediums. Then he says, OK, copy. And then he comes in, he says, we're going on to the hards, the strategist. And then he said, and then the strategist says, just to back his point up, it's too late now. And then, um, and then Kimmy always says, it's never too late, which is the killer line. <laughs> um, but those are my two. I nominated. mean, it, that line is going to be on our gravestones one day, Fergus. Exactly. We get like generations, generations of people will talk about, you know, K. Raikkonen. That's going to be, you know, it's going to be an Insta on Instagram captions, you know, for hundreds of years to come. K. Raikkonen saying, it's never too late. And yes, um, exactly. so two very good nominations there from Fergus. I'd have one nomination. And I think given my rant earlier in this episode, it might be obvious. But my award goes to Mattia Bonotto for thinking he has us all fooled with him <laughs> going on about not being able to explain, you know, the sudden lack of performance from the Ferrari and saying that it's, no, it's a once-off thing. It's going to be fine by Monza and thinking that we all believe him. So I would like to, from my side, give Mattia Bonotto um, the award for most dunderheaded deed. Cool. So the next one is the Lewis Hamilton hashtag blessed award for luckiest driver. So who do you think? Luckiest driver? I mean, it's quite a hard one to say the luckiest driver. But I'm going to say the luckiest driver is... Who is the luckiest driver? I was going to joke and say Carlos Sainz because he didn't have to pass his teammate three times a lap. <laughs> but, um... um <laughs> luckiest driver... Uh, probably Lewis Hamilton, you know. just He's just lucky. He's just fueled by luck, clearly. I mean, it's in the name, right? The, the award is named after Hamilton, so I exactly. mean, that should tell you something. I'm going to take a bit of an alternative route. I'm going to say Max Verstappen is the luckiest driver of the Belgian Grand Prix. And why, <laughs> you may ask? Uh, well, he's he lucky nothing. that the Belgian Grand Prix is not 46 laps long and was 44 laps long. Yeah, that's true. Because if that Grand Prix was two laps longer, he would have lost out to Daniel, I think. Yep. I think, well, I mean, obviously you mentioned with all those tyres at the end. And then, are we, should we move on to the, the final award? Let's move on to the final award, which is, of course, the Nico Hülkenberg Podium Award for Unluckiest Driver. Now, this one, I think to me, there's an obvious candidate, right? Yeah. I don't know if, if you and I, if, if the two of us have the same one in mind. Is it Carlos Sainz? Yes, I think, obviously, the obvious candidate is, uh, is Carlos Sainz. However, would it be, you know, we can look at unluckiest driver. We could say, uh, you could say, you know, uh, Daniel Ricciardo, because, you know, 
obviously he was very good, but if he was in that, I don't know, if, well, pretty much any, he drove a brilliant race, and who knows what he could have done if he was in, you know, a slightly better aero package car. Good point, and I mean, he's also unlucky because the Spa um, Grand Prix wasn't uh, 46 laps long, it was 24 yeah. laps long, so... Oh, can this I go shows back you. on my nomination for the luckiest person? Of go the for it. Go Is for Cyril it. a beatable because he didn't have to get the tattoo? True. That's that a good idea. point, actually. Although at this point, like, I think Cyril would sort of just want that tattoo because <laughs> I think... You know, the tattoo is a bit of a two, two for the price of one deal, where he gets a tattoo and he gets to keep his job. So I think at this point, if he gets that, gets the tattoo, he'll be pretty pleased because I mean, that would be the first Renault podium since forever. Like, can't even remember when last they had a podium. But in any case, I think those are all very, very good nominations and winners. So congratulations, everybody. Um, may you put this prime and center in all of your trophy cabinets i mean somebody like um who who doesn't have any trophies i guess all of them has trophies so i mean that joke we can we can leave that then um Marvin, but i guess ragunathan i mean one day he's gonna win and then he can put this 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 award you know front and center in his very barren trophy cabinet Is so it? i guess that concludes the the, the review of the belgian grand prix obviously we're going to be back in, um, in less than a week's time because it's going to be the Italian Grand Prix. I'm so excited. I love watching the cars go around Monza. It's always a fun race. Um, Fergus, thank you so much for taking the time, for being able to weather the storm of being on, on one of my podcast episodes. <laughs> I know it's quite chaotic. So, so thank you so much for taking the time. Yeah, well, to be honest, uh, I hope everyone who's listened has enjoyed it as much as I have enjoyed being on here. It's been an absolute pleasure. Ah, I'm so glad to hear that. So I guess maybe let's just get, get housekeeping out of the way before I let all of you go. Please, if you like this episode, you know, leave me a sneaky comment or please give me a thumbs up. Or if you're feeling really generous, please hit the subscribe button. Please also go and do the same on Fergus's channel. He has really, really cool stuff. Some really, really nice interviews as well. You can follow me on Twitter. I am at TF1Show. And Fergus, correct me if I'm wrong, you're at Fergie Master. That is correct. On Twitter. And yes. um, just quickly, uh, you guys, make sure you give Tennis a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts. Make sure you're doing yes. that. You're listening. A five-star uh, rating for a five-star individual. Exactly. That's, that's me. <laughs> All right, and on that on that uh, very humble note, let's uh, let's conclude the episode for today. Thank you everybody for watching, and I'll see you next week for the Monza race review. Cheers. Hola.